On this episode of Urban U, we celebrate Women's History Month with portraits of trailblazing CUNY women past and present. We share the story of the powerful, radical thinker Audre Lorde and sit down with a CUNY grad, now queen in the Democratic Republic of Congo, working tirelessly toward a more interconnected world. We showcase a CUNY Women's Center that plays a pivotal role in its diverse community, and more including music with the woman behind the curtain back in the golden age of Hollywood. Welcome to Urban U. Audrey Lord was dedicated to freedom, both personal and political. Her words were her weapons in the struggle against oppression in all its forms. And CUNY was lucky enough to have her be part of our community, both as a student and a teacher. I cannot recall the words of my first poem, but I remember the promise I made my pen, never to leave it lying in somebody else's love. Audrey was a powerhouse. Um, she was involved with, you know, all the movements. Um, the civil rights movement began in that period. Eleanor Roosevelt came to Hunter when I was president of student council and said, go south for freedom. And, you know, we did. We went on all the marches and protests and sit-ins. The 60s, the 70s were periods when people were telling us not to be outspoken you know, keep your views to yourself. And Audrey thought that was the most dangerous thing in the world. Lord was an iconoclast from an early age. She didn't speak until the age of five, and when she did, she primarily communicated through poetry. By the age of 15, she had had her first poem published in Seventeen magazine. She was the first black student to attend Hunter High School and went on to receive her BA from Hunter College. I was active in student government, and she was editor of the school literary magazine. We became fast friends almost immediately, and we just remained friends for life. Having graduated from Hunter in 1959, the 60s were to bring marriage and children, more activism, and her first teaching job at Tougaloo College. While poet in residence at Tougaloo, her first book of poetry was published and she met her future partner, Frances Clayton. Lord said later that it was at Tougaloo where she became convinced, anti-academic though I am, that poets must teach what they know if we are to continue being. At the City University of New York, I teach young people. She was a fabulous teacher. Her passion for teaching was her love for young people. She encouraged her students to write, and she helped nurture and enhance the lives of many poets and writers um, who flocked to her classes. Audrey loved her years at Hunter, so it was a very special relationship. So they created the Audrey Lord Poetry Center. There's a street now, Audrey Lord Way, right near Hunter College and the special relationship continues because her words are required reading by her former students who are now the professors, you know, in various departments, psychology, literature, history. Throughout her years at CUNY, Lord worked tirelessly for the many causes she believed in. She was involved with all of the movements for peace and racial justice and social justice and, and gay rights. And she built bridges. I think why she is so globally beloved is that she transcended all the barriers and all the divisions. None of them mattered to Audrey. Why do you think Audrey's still being taught and so many people are still fans and involved with her work? Audrey changed the story and then used her great gifts as the most beautiful, mellifluous, powerful poet and essayist to give us the words to keep the story ongoing and changing. 
there is no hierarchy of oppression. I cannot afford to believe that freedom from intolerance is the right of only one particular group, and I cannot afford to choose between the fronts upon which I must battle these forces of discrimination wherever they appear to destroy me. In 1991, Audre Lorde was named New York State Poet Laureate. The next year, after a 14-year battle with cancer, Audre Lorde spent her final days in St. Croix, Virgin Islands, continuing her activism with her partner at the time, Dr. Gloria Joseph. On the back of the Audre Lorde Way celebration program, there are some of Audre's favorite quotes and I had wanted to read them. It starts with, women are powerful and dangerous. It is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate our differences. Audrey would always say, revolution is a process, not an event. And I think that's really important. And then, Change is the immediate responsibility of each of us, wherever, however, we are standing in whatever arena we choose. And so there it is, her legacy, change, love, action. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So, it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. I'm Scott Kirby for Urban U. When you look at Black literature, you can see that sometimes people have very narrow visions of what constitutes black literature. If you just looked on the New York Times bestsellers list, you would not realize the range of black writers who are writing. It's an issue that Dr. Brenda Green knows well. As a professor of English at Megar Evers College, where she founded the Center for Black Literature, she spent much of her professional life amplifying the work of black authors. Literature ends up getting uh, shared by word of mouth, by platforms such as ours, the Center for Black Literature throughout conferences. The center hosts writing retreats, a reading series, a youth program, and publishes works through the Killens Journal. Every year in March, writers look forward to its marquee event, the National Black Writers Conference and Symposium. In 1986, several years before the center was established, the conference was founded by the late John Oliver Killens, with Dr. Green as the event coordinator at the time. The annual occasion has since become a game changer for Black writers. It has impacted um, our contemporary writers. It's been inspirational for emerging writers. The center has also hosted and honored countless legendary writers like Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou. Greetings and welcome to Writers on Writing. I am your host, Dr. Brenda Green from the Center for Black Literature. Dr. Green's radio show, Writers on Writing, is yet another outlet through which she highlights authors and demonstrates her true passion for literature. Enter her home and you'll find books of different genres at every turn. A champion of literature and the mother of two writers, including famed hip hop artist Talib Kweli, she's managed to follow her true calling. I was one of those children who read continuously. And I look at my granddaughter, who she reminds me, she's 12 years old, and she reminds me of myself when I go to the library and get, you know, like seven, eight books. <laughs> we had a bookmobile. I would read the books under the cover. But I didn't really start reading um, books by black writers until I got into college because they were not around. When I got into college, I came in as an MLK scholar. Martin Luther King scholar, the students had um, demonstrated and said this was 1967, 68, and they wanted to see more black students on campus. So going to NYU was a transformative experience because I was in a space, I say space conceptually, in a place with other black students from around the city and the country who had been mostly and predominantly white 
schools and we all came together. While at NYU, she joined black student groups and took her first course in black literature and African-American studies. Later, she made this promise to herself. When I went into teaching, I would make sure that my students were exposed to writers and really did not experience what I had. Abby Ashola for Urban U. Hi, I'm Raquel Miller, and I'm a student majoring in journalism at Hunter College. Here's what's making CUNY news this Women's History Month. And we'd like to also say happy birthday to the Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education, turning 40 years this year. Women's centers have had a long history at CUNY campuses. The one at Brooklyn College plays a particularly important role in its community. We spoke to its director and student leaders to learn more. Of the 10 women's centers across CUNY, the center at Brooklyn College has been around the longest. Founded in the mid-70s on the heels of Roe v. Wade legalizing abortion across the country, it is the biggest and most well-funded center in the CUNY system. Longtime director Sao Fong Ao tells us more. We provide services related to mental health, academic advisement, uh, crisis intervention, as well as uh, our whole wide range of mentorship and coaching. While these services are important, fostering a safe and welcoming community is Sao Fong's main goal in what is statistically one of the most diverse college campuses in the country. I think that as a woman of color, particular woman who have Asian descent and, um, and also speaking English with a with noticeable accent, and those day-to-day -day experience have an imprint on how you see the world. It's just like a safe space for me to just like, you know, hang out, get my work done, you know, just like a home away from home because I am here all day long. My favorite thing is the fact that it's my home in college. It gives you like a free opportunity to build connections, not only with the people who you never meet before, but the people with like other majors, it's like how you guys could build a networking skill. College's job is really simple. It really provides the best education and provide the best education experience for our students. In fact, U.S. News World & Report has named Brooklyn College as the most ethnically diverse school in the region for five years running. Of particular note is the large immigrant and Muslim population on campus. Sao Fong says formulating services specific to the Brooklyn College community is paramount. The occupation of a space signified the sense of beyond belonging. And I think that particularly for immigrants, when you enter, come to a country that is different, uh, there's a sense of displacement. And I think that there are different ways to diffuse those sense of di displacement and replace it with a sense of belonging. Having fuller funding and staffing than many of its counterparts, the Brooklyn College Women's Center is able to provide a uniquely broad and impressive range of offerings. Everything from food and housing insecurity, to reproductive rights and advocacy, to educational counseling and career networking. And it's Sao Fong's hope that the success and longevity of Brooklyn College's Women's Center can be matched at other campuses, at CUNY and beyond, with more resources and support across the board, so that more students are given the tools they need to succeed. More relevant now than ever. From the Women's Center at Brooklyn College, I'm Nora Wesson for Urban U. Still up on Urban U, born in Europe and raised in Africa, Diambika Batsuila came to America to become a Staten Island College student and then became a queen. And from Brooklyn to Hollywood, the woman behind the curtain, songwriter Sylvia Fine. Stay tuned. Words. Words illuminate, infuriate, humiliate, and elevate. They can start wars and stop them. Words entice and excite. 
and words certainly have that effect on this young scholar. She's one of the organizers for TEDx CUNY, which is, of course, all about words. And she's been eagerly waiting for this upcoming all-day TEDx CUNY event to happen. I grew up watching TED Talks. I feel like a lot of CUNY students have an institution like as diverse and as open as CUNY um, not only deserve this platform but needed it to spread ideas. TEDx CUNY really hopes to amplify CUNY voices and local voices and making sure that our stories are also heard and our ideas are spread. Emily is the daughter of Guyanese immigrants who settled in New York City and worked hard to give her the opportunities she needed. She's a first-generation college student at the Macaulay Honors College at John Jay College. When the plan finally came together for CUNY to organize their own TEDx, Emily was over the moon that the theme selected was Who We Are. She says it's perfect for her and perfect for CUNY. And we really wanted to explore the diversity that really is New York City and that is CUNY. That theme is perfect for one of the featured TEDx CUNY speakers, Professor Emily Rice as well. She's an associate professor of astrophysics at Macaulay, teaches the physics PhD program at CUNY's Grad Center, and is a resident research associate in astrophysics at the American Museum of Natural History. So why does she love the theme so much? The talk that I'm going to give um, is uh, kind of my origin story, I think, a little bit, and I'm playing with it. So I love the theme of who we are as CUNY, and so I'm going to talk about my identity as a scientist and my path as a scientist, but I'm also going to use science to kind of understand that. And what was the first TED Talk that Emily Madre remembers watching? I remember the first one that I watched was in high school. It was The Danger of a Single Story um, by Adichie. And for the record, TEDx CUNY is the only public university TEDx conference in New York City and the first to represent multiple campuses. This is our first conference in four years. Um, it will be held on March 10th, 2023 at the Gerald Lynch Theater. It is an all-day event and CUNY students and affiliates can attend for free. For Urban U, I'm Mike Gilliam. CUNY counts a lot of foreign-born students among its voices. What it doesn't count a lot of is the voice of literal royalty. When I'm back in the village, it looks like how God wanted us to be like and to live like, because I feel like it provided everything for us. My land is very green, uh, the dirt is very red and very rich. My people are simple people, but they live in harmony with nature. So I feel freer when I'm home, but I also realize the pressure is enormous for us to move to a different you know, stage of development. My name is uh, Diambi Kabatuswila. Uh, my title is uh, Queen Diambi Kabatuswila Chiyomwata. Mukalenga Mukaji Wankashama Wabakwaluntu Wabaluba Wakasai Wakongo. So the title means Woman King of the of the Order of the Leopard of the Bakwaluntu, who are part of the Luba ethnic group uh, that are in Kasai, in the region of Kasai, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's a title that bears reciting in full, not just out of some sense of royalty, but also out of a sense of celebrating cultural heritage and sharing it with the world because much of Queen Diambi's life has been an endeavor to honor her roots while also pushing progress forward. Born in Belgium and raised in the capital of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Kinshasa, she found the university culture in Europe not to her liking, but found a home in the States on Staten Island. I loved the ambiance that was in CUNY in CSI, and I just said, why not? So instead of applying to many schools, I liked to be in Staten Island as well. I felt a little more shielded as being coming from an, a small, tiny country that is Belgium and being in this gigantic you know, city. It offered me such a safe environment to learn and also that I, the, the team, that my, my academic team, was so engaged into, into making sure that I had everything I needed to, to succeed. Um, really, for the first time, I had the experience of people really trusting and believing in me and believing that I was capable. And certainly, Queen Diambi has proved more than capable. As she defines her people, she said the Luntu number only around three million. And as is the story of much of African history, 
predations on resources, slave trade, and colonialism decimated the territory and governing systems of her people's original Luba Empire. So when Diambi was chosen as queen in 2016, and yes, kings and queens must be chosen from the royal line by a council, they don't automatically get it just by birth, her desire to amplify the voices and grandeur of her people couldn't rely on the level of resources as we associate, say, with the royal family in London. They had to be earned. I wanted to bring water wells. And also in Kinshasa, where I grew up, I wanted to participate in helping uh, orphanage systems. But when I was a, a crown, I was not a millionaire, I was a thousandaire and a tiny one too. So I didn't have enough finances to, to cover and fix all the problems. I would have been able maybe to build 10 wells. And then after that, I would have been it. So Queen Diambi started her nonprofit, the Alikia Hope Foundation, aiming to support her people in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and throughout the world, with a particular aim on providing water, medical centers, education, and global African cultural outreach. Looking around, I realized there was a lot of needs that I could participate in fulfilling, but the biggest need I felt was the voice of my people. And I felt like that voice needed to be amplified that voice of the truth of our identity. Because growing up in Africa, they told me they had to, to run away from being an African. And to now be able to see African queens depicted in media and to be able to represent her people, and more importantly, see the lessons she thinks African culture can impart to the world on a greater stage has been one of the greatest rewards for this royal monarch and Staten Island graduate. When I grew up, it was not even talked about. I'd never ever seen in any Disney movie or any Disney cartoon or any movie for that matter, an African queen. And I've actually seen a lot of little girls uh, play me. So it's like life changing to see a little four year old run around and with a like carry shell on her head and say, I'm Queen Diambi and I'm going around the world and I'm coming to bring peace. And it's like, wow. So it's, we write the story. For Urban U, I'm Ari Goldberg. Coco the puppet can jump through a ring. Swing on a swing, spring on a spring. Yes, Popo the puppet can do anything when somebody else pulls the string. The string this the string. is Danny Kaye, one of the most famous entertainers of the 20th century. Comedian, singer, actor, dancer, a multi-talented icon of song, stage, and screen. From Television City in Hollywood, it's the Danny Kay Show. But behind the stardom, and at many times one could perhaps say pulling Popo's strings, was lyricist, composer, producer, oftentimes manager, and wife, Sylvia Fine. In fact, Kay once said of Fine, when a reporter asked about his success, I'm a wife-made man. And to be sure, Fine was a star in her own right. Born in Brooklyn in 1913, she would take classes at Hunter College and later graduated with a degree in music from Brooklyn College, actually penning the music, but not the lyrics, for the school's original alma mater song. And it was indeed music that Sylvia Fine would make her mark on the entertainment world. When the two formally met in 1939, on the set of a small theater troupe, Fine recognized Kay's star power immediately. And as a songwriter, crafted many of her songs specifically with Kay's comic talents for voices and rapid fire patter delivery in mind. Give me thread and the needle. I itch, I twitch to stitch. I'm a glutton for cutting, for putting with the button. To snip and plug, nip and tuck, fix and trim, turn that brim, tote that bird. Fine was deeply involved in her husband's career management, writing over 100 songs for him and co-producing classic films like The Court Jester. Shakespeare and Francis Bacon, would they declare? But certainly, a strong-willed woman in the 1940s, in the male-dominated world of Hollywood, didn't always make for an easy road for the couple. But Fine would also find tremendous success outside the context of her partnership with Kay. 
In the 1950s and 60s, for her original songs, she would be nominated for two Oscars. And in the 70s, she lent her expertise to education and began teaching classes in musical comedy at the University of Southern California and Yale. Good evening. My name is Sylvia Fine. She would later turn her attention to television production, winning a Peabody for her PBS special, Musical Comedy Tonight, proving so popular as to warrant two follow-up specials Every in the 80s, both being nominated for Emmys. Learning how to sin, not how to think, how to mix a gin right in the sink. And you know what kind of college you're at, right? <laughs> Kay would die in 1987 and Fine in 1991, and their archives would be enshrined in the Library of Congress exhibition, Two Kids from Brooklyn. But her legacy to CUNY didn't end there, as just being a famous alum. In 1987, just a year after Kay's death, Fine would donate $1 million to renovate a Hunter College theater in her and her husband's name, opening in 1993 as the Sylvia and Danny Kay Playhouse, still in use today. And the next year, the president of Brooklyn College asked her to write new lyrics for the school's alma mater song. Finally getting to finish the tune she started on as a student 55 years earlier. On a former field in Flatbush, now a campus, lush and green, proudly stands our alma mater, ever lovely and serene. Sylvia Fine. 1988, Hollywood songwriting star and kid from Brooklyn. For Urban U, I'm Ari Goldberg. We end our show with congratulations to our CUNY Distinguished Professor Emerita Tanya Leon, recently honored by the Kennedy Center for her lifetime achievements in the performing arts. For more episode highlights and sneak peeks into our upcoming stories, meet us on our social media platforms. Thank you for watching these stories from the largest urban university in the nation, the City University of New York. <laughs>